Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. As the coronavirus pandemic spread, a race began to develop testing protocols and ramp up research to find treatments and hopefully a vaccine against the virus. Joining us to discuss is Dr. Andrew Badley, Chair of Mayo Clinic's COVID-19 Research Task Force. Welcome to the program, Dr. Badley. Thank you, Sanj. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you uh, tell us how uh, this happened for you, how you got to start leading the uh, COVID-19 uh, research? A little over four weeks ago, I got an email from Dr. Gores, the Executive Dean of Research, asking me if I'd uh, consider taking this role. And I was honored and uh, rapidly accepted. And within minutes, I was uh, engulfed in the, in the flood of activity surrounding COVID. Obviously, there's a, a whole volume of information that came to you. How did you wrap your head around what's happened and where we need to go moving forward? So at first it was reactive, trying to deal with the urgent things. But within a few days, my uh, administrative partner in this activity, Amanda McHale, she and I came up with what we like to think of as almost a platform approach to to handling COVID-19. In the interim, we've created 12 parallel work streams that deal with everything we can imagine related to SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and COVID-19, the disease. And those work streams cover uh, basic virology. We have capabilities to do basic virology experiments on the virus, to artificial intelligence activities, to database, to prospective biobanking, to translational studies, to immunology studies, to clinical trials and clinical trial implementation. Can you tell us about the clinical trials that you're leading and, and how they're developing? So we, we Mayo have reviewed in excess of 70 clinical trials. Broadly speaking, there's two categories of clinical trials that we're considering. Category number one is agents that might impact viral replication, and we deal with those in one way. And category number two are, are clinical trials of agents that might impact the inflammatory cascade. So usually when a a drug is being tested uh, for treating a certain disease, it goes through a pathway that the FDA governs. How has that changed given what we're looking for is a rapid treatment for this pandemic? So it's changed dramatically, both on the FDA side as well as on the Mayo side, all for the better. Um, So FDA has stepped up and has recognized that this is a critical need. And so they have changed their approval processes and timelines uh, and expedited review of some compounds. So whereas it used to take days to weeks for an approval, I've seen approvals in as little as six hours, and I've seen a number of approvals in 24 to 48 hours. Within the Mayo side, uh, we have streamlined all of the activities we need for uh, trial approval and trial initiation so that the fastest trial we've had uh, approved with you know, tremendous help from all of our regulatory colleagues and, and the IRB, the fastest we've seen now is in about seven days from protocol receipt to trial initiation. Well, that, that is amazing and a, and a testimony to you and, and the team at Mayo Clinic as well to get this done. Obviously, for a clinical trial, you need patients, and that sometimes can be a rate-limiting step. Have you found that to be a problem with the trials that you're leading? Depending on perspective, unfortunately not, <laughs> um, in that we, we have plenty of patients in the Rochester area and the Mayo Clinic Health System who have COVID disease. We're not in a situation where we're overwhelmed like some of the hospitals in Boston and New York are, but we have plenty of admissions. Every day, a uh, treatment guidance group uh, meets virtually um, to review current patients in hospital and new admissions overnight and we review the clinical trials that we have activated, and we review each patient for do they meet inclusion criteria, yes or no, and if they meet inclusion criteria for clinical trials or multiple clinical trials, which of those trials do we recommend for those therapies? So these clinical trials, are they nationwide or are they just in the local uh, area? Most of the trials we're involved with are in fact nationwide clinical trials. Um, There are a couple of therapies which are being advanced by Mayo investigators. One of those trials is up and running and is currently Mayo only on an expanded use basis. A phase three trial of that particular agent will be started very soon and I believe is in front of FDA right now. What do you mean by a phase three trial? 
The phase three trial is a randomized trial to determine is there efficacy compared to placebo um, for treating disease with uh, patient-centric outcomes of improvement and survival and those kinds of things. We've heard about certain medications that can be used to treat uh, coronavirus. What, what's your message to the public regarding that? As of today, there are no approved therapies for treatment of coronavirus disease. Uh, and therefore, I think it behooves us to have a certain degree of equipoise uh, and to test these in controlled manner so that we can get uh, definitive conclusions. So we've been talking about treatments, but obviously the holy grail is also developing a, a vaccine. How far are we from having a vaccine for coronavirus? There are multiple other vaccines which are being developed. Mayo's been in conversations with Johnson & Johnson about their vaccine platform. We're going to be in conversations with Sanofi and GSK about their vaccine. And there's a variety of investigators within Mayo who are coming up with their own vaccine approaches. And so to get to the point of having a vaccine in humans is not that far away. That, however, is a long way from knowing if that vaccine causes protection. So as you said, there is so much research going on. I mean, it's difficult for the human brain to compute all that. I know you can do that, but, but most uh, cannot. Can you tell us about how artificial intelligence at Mayo Clinic is helping us with COVID-19 research? So Mayo has had a uh, significant presence in the artificial intelligence space, and it is continuing to grow that. As many of the audience will know, Mayo uh, has a artificial intelligence-based platform, which is led by Dr. John Halemka. Mayo also has a strategic partnership with a company called Inference, which is an artificial intelligence company um, out of the East Coast. We are partnering with Inference and, and the platform in several different ways. The first way, which is already up and running, I believe has already made an impact on COVID disease and transmission. So as we plot, um, where infections are incurring, most of the programs which track that measure just the number of positive cases that you have. And obviously that can be biased by not doing any cases in an area. So if you have no positive cases, but no tests in that area, you could falsely assume that there's not a lot of cases there. We also know that if you start tracking the rate of positive cases, that if you get to a very high level of positive cases like we, we were seeing in Italy, um, that probably means we're not capturing enough of the cases. Conversely, if you get to a very low rate of number of positive cases, that means you're probably testing the population well. And an example of that is in Japan. So early on, um, Mayo created a real-time tracking platform to measure the rate of positive cases uh, throughout all counties in Minnesota. And when we did that, we noticed that there was an outlier which occurred in Martin County. The mm -hmm. rate of positive tests in Martin County was approaching 10%, whereas the rate of positive testing for most of the other counties was in the neighborhood of one or 2%. So that's obviously here. Has that been rolled out across the country? We're beginning to have conversations with other states to offer the same capabilities and, and the last I heard, they're still in the conversation stage. Well, thank you and your team for spearheading these efforts. Obviously, you know, it's not only about treatment, but also prevention. Can you also explain how else you're using AI regarding COVID-19 and uh, treatment protocols? So understanding the disease pathogenesis is going to be critical to align different treatment strategies with different disease stages. And so one of the things that artificial intelligence can do is it can synthesize massive amounts of data very, very quickly. We've been able to look at massive amounts of data, hundreds of millions of documents, and extract the pertinent uh, components of that to help understand disease pathophysiology. So one example is um, using these approaches, we have identified which cells in the human body express the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 receptor is what the SARS coronavirus 2 binds to to gain entry and cause infection. As we did that, we identified that um, some tissues that you'd expect have that receptor, and that includes the nasopharynx and the oropharynx and the lungs, and we all know that, that the virus goes there. We also identified that other tissues that aren't quite as 
expected to, to have direct infection are also involved. And that includes the heart and the gut and the kidney and in fact the testes. And it turns out that all of those tissues are showing evidence that they can be dysfunctional during COVID disease. So we now know that there is a substantial portion of patients get a myocarditis, acute kidney injury with proteinuria and hematuria. There's a, a significant proportion, about 25% in our experience, who have gastrointestinal symptoms and or diarrhea. And based on that data set, before we'd seen a large number of cases, we predicted that we'd start to see some cases of orchitis or swelling of the testes. And lo and behold, we started to see some cases of, of orchitis. So this has all happened in the last 100 days, Dr. Badley. Obviously, the, everything is changing and it's evolving. How do you foresee the next 100 days moving forward? So I predict that within the next 100 days, there are likely to be drugs identified which make meaningful, favorable impact into patients who have COVID disease. And it's possible that one or two of those therapies could go as far as being approved and therefore made hopefully available to everyone to be prescribed outside of the confines of clinical trial. Well, that's an uplifting uh, note absolutely to, to end on there. Andrew, anything else that you wanted to add? This has been a tremendous response from the entire Mayo community. Everybody at every role has come together to synergize, to efficiently move and advance everything we're doing into clinical practice. And it's been a unbelievable thing to observe. And everybody who has played a role, I believe, has helped to save our patients. That's number one. Number two, when we're faced with such devastating illness, um, it's hard to see a silver lining. But if there is a silver lining to be had from this, I, I'd like to think several things will happen. So number one is that we'll begin to appreciate and recognize and implement practices of public health more widely across the US and the world. Number two is that we implement those public health policies that we know make a difference. For example, we know that influenza vaccination makes a difference in saved lives. I am hopeful that the public adoption of those interventions will increase as time goes on. And then number three is we are uh, in the position of having such a depth of scientific understanding today and such a depth of good therapeutic candidates at our disposal, that it took literally weeks to get the first clinical trials in place. And that's because of a robust basic and clinical science pipeline that is so critical. And my third hope is that this is increasingly recognized and basic and clinical translational research will be continued to be funded in the manner that it should be. Our thanks to Dr. Andrew Badley, Chair of Mayo Clinic's COVID-19 Research Task Force, Dr. Badley, thank you for your time and hard work. It's been a great pleasure, and thank you all. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on Podcasts. Thanks for listening, and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.